It's tough to be your best right now. There's a lot of people who are complaining. There's a lot of people who are upset. There's a lot of people who often out in the culture start like just, just thriving on that negativity and chaos. And it makes it hard for really positive, really progressive, really like people who are excited to change the world and do their good works. It's difficult and I know that. So you being a high performer and being here right now, dedicating your life and working really hard to being your best and making great contributions in the world, it can be hard. And I know that and that's what this session is about this month. We're gonna take on what, what's it like when you have those dark days, those disappointments, those huge setbacks that happen inevitably to all of us. And how can you use your mind and set up a few habits to overcome those a little faster, to cope with them in a responsible manner, but also, you know, to, to feel alive again after those really dark days. That's a big topic here we're gonna talk about. It's not always the most inspiring thing when we talk about the difficult days, but I do know that we all have to learn to be more resilient if we're gonna be high performers. We have to learn how to transform all that negative, chaotic energy into something that we have a sense of control about and that we can create some positive outcomes toward the things that we want in our life. And that's hard when maybe your business is struggling or your spouse isn't supportive or somebody in your family is sick or having really bad health or got a bad medical report. I know all that's hard. So I'm here to cheer you on this week, but also give you some capabilities and maybe new ways to look at a few things and try a, new th try a few new things that will get you out of those dark days a little faster. And the first piece I wanna really talk about is maybe something most people don't think about. And that is often the dark days we have, the crushing defeats, the difficulties of life, often they're not preventable. I mean, you can't prevent maybe all the medical reports when they're bad. You can't prevent maybe every difficulty at the business. But here's what I have found over and over. The people who keep getting knocked off their feet over and over, who can't get back to resilience or back to high performance, often fail to do something very simple that it turns out some of the world's greatest leaders do. And that's a very simple thing. That is to learn to anticipate drama. Learn to anticipate drama or turmoil or difficulty or challenge. Now again, I know we've got people from all walks of life here. We have some people who are, or who are dealing with some major issues. So let me give some examples here from minor issues to bigger issues, okay? Sometimes, let's say, you, 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 know, you, you end up at the end of the day, and you had that big meeting earlier in the day and it didn't go the way you thought it did. And you're really disappointed about how it turned out. And what happens often is disappointment is often a lack of having not anticipated enough things in advance. And so what ends up happening is you kind of roll in with all these high expectations, but you didn't anticipate the difficulties or the challenges that will come up, right? It turns out uh, a lot of work that done by, done by like Jim Collins and other organizational leaders have found out that leaders tend to anticipate drama in the sense that they're a little bit paranoid. They're, they're not paranoid in a negative way or an obsessive way, but they're so thoughtful about what might go wrong that they're less disappointed later on. So for example, if you're gonna go in that big important meeting of the day and you're really excited about this meeting, you're finally gonna be vulnerable and share your ideas and be excited about your new dream, your new idea, and you plan out everything you're gonna say and you plan out how to do the clothes and, and you think through everything and you practice everything, but then in the middle of that meeting, someone goes, well, I think that's a stupid idea. And you didn't anticipate that drama. You didn't anticipate that someone's gonna doubt you. Someone is gonna object. Someone's gonna interrupt you. If you don't anticipate those things, they really throw you off and they rattle you so much so that later on, you're a hot mess about it. Like later on, you're like, oh my God, I didn't think that person was gonna say this and they didn't that. Everything in life, if you're gonna be a high performer, you might take a step back and say, what's gonna trip me up about this? Many of you know that I do that every single morning in the shower. So the second question I ask in the shower is always, what might trip me up today or throw me off and how would my highest self meet that? I ask that every single day. I look at my calendar. When I look at my calendar, I see big events come up. I go, okay, 
What might, be, what might go sideways there? What might not work out well? And by anticipating that, when it comes up, I'm calm. I already saw it in my mind. I already knew it might happen. I already anticipated what to do. But I mean this also at a more difficult level of life, right? That sometimes there's gonna be some major, major turmoil in life. And let's say you're heading into a breakup of a relationship. So many people go into the breakup of a relationship and they don't think it through. And so they don't anticipate that of course the other person's gonna fight for what they want. Of course the other person is going to become selfish at some point. Of course the other person's gonna become scared at some point. Of course the other person is going to um, you know, argue and blame. But when those things happen, people are so surprised. I can't believe you're blaming me. I go, you're breaking up with someone and you can't believe the person's blaming you? Have you not lived one rotation around the earth yet? <laughs> you know, it's like they forget human behavior. They didn't anticipate it. And I hope you get this. This also applies to health, right? I, I'm always surprised how people who are like 50 years old who often say, geez, you know, I, I'm really surprised my body's stiffening up. You haven't moved in seven years. You didn't anticipate that if you don't move in seven years, you're gonna feel like crap. And that's what happens, is that all of a sudden, health goes down, people didn't anticipate. Of course, as you get older, you have to do more to take care of your health, duh. So you can't wake up one day and go, I feel so sad, I'm sore and old and gross. How did you not know that was gonna happen? How did you not know that they were gonna interrupt you in the meeting? How did you not know that the first time you, uh, you know, made your pitch to that prospect, they were gonna say no? You have to anticipate the no's. You have to anticipate the difficulties, the bad health days, the difficulties. Second big idea I wanna share with you here is to learn to delay your response. Specifically, what I want you to do is delay your emotional response. Now, this is where, uh, you know, some people say, well, Brandon, that's a pretty stoic thing to say. And I'm like, well, yeah, maybe. I mean, stoicism has a lot to teach people. And I think it's important that when something goes on, not to freak out about it. So many people, here's what they do. Something negative happens and immediately they believe or think that it's the end of times. And so they anticipate total destruction in the moment something simple happens. Like they anticipate total failure, total horrible, and they get all worked up and they get super emotional about stuff when it's just like, you don't even know it's gonna happen yet. Or even if it did just happen, just delay your response. You, you get that terrible email and it fires you up. Someone writes you a bad email, right? A customer, coworker, and you get and all the fire is coming up and you just feel like you're gonna spit acid at the world. You're so angry, what do you do? Well, first I would say, why don't you delay that, learn to delay the time between stimulus and response, right? Before you jump to anger, can you see the email and not get to anger? Delay that. Delay that emotional response a little bit more, right? It's so easy to just go with the emotions, but often, the way to cope and be resilient more is to think about the thoughts that you are having and ask, are these thoughts that I'm having, are these emotions that I'm having actually supporting me in coping with this, moving through it, or serving as a role model? Are these thoughts and emotions I'm having actually helping me cope with it, move through it well, or be a role model? And so I think that all the time. You know, when, when, when there's thousands of people on, on, who we care about, who's part of this community that we deeply care about, and all of a sudden our, our live cast goes dead, we don't freak out. We just don't. We just say, okay, take a, breathe, take a breath. Let's go through this checklist. Let's check this. Plug that thing in. Do this thing. Let's go. That's all you can do. But if you let yourself freak out, it end, if you like go to immediate freak out, then what ends up happening is you're also training your mind and your body to go to immediate freak out. The way that you deal with every little bit of surprise and every little bit of drama and every little bit of disappointment is only setting you up for how you're gonna deal with the next one. So if you're freaking out about all the little things, when that big thing happens, you're gonna be a disaster. So what I tell people all the time is, go through the day and start training yourself to delay response time. 
Like just start training yourself. Like if you, if you feel a, a negative emotion coming on or you wanna immediately fight back or you wanna immediately say something negative, just breathe it out a little bit. Take two or three deep breaths and kind of wait and see a little bit. You know, the great spiritual teachers, read any great spiritual text and you will see that every single great spiritual guru, every single great spiritual leader of, of any times and any faith, they had a calmness when the drama was around. They didn't jump to anger. Often they asked questions. Often they delayed their response. Someone would ask a big question and they'd say, ah, good question. They'd close their eyes and they'd meditate for 20 minutes and come back with something. Like we're in such a culture of like speed, 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 answer, 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 respond, 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 retaliate, retaliate, retaliate. I'm kind of like, take a breather. Don't let anybody fool you into thinking you need to reply immediately to anything. Like life is on your clock. It's on your timeline. And you need to start with that as a presupposition. So when a negative event happens, as an example, and everyone's like, Brendan, what do we do? do, 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 do? Often, it's, I just take a, a breather and I, I think about it for a minute. And then I'm decisive and we move. Okay, next up. You've got to allow and to socialize sadness. Look, when I promised to talk about the dark days and the disappointment. You know, you have to allow sadness to happen. And you can't apologize for it. You, you, you can't try to hide it. Like, like sadness is one of those things that does happen. And it's not always easy to delay. If you're sad, allow it. Stop fighting it so much. Just be like, I am sad that I lost that business deal. I am sad that I lost that family member. I am sad that this negative thing happened. I didn't want it. One of the ways that I move through sadness so quickly and terrible things happen in my business or my life, losing family and friends and clients, um, having business deals go in the tank, watching you know people I care for really be mistreated, was the ability to go, God, that really does bum me out. And, and allow it, not rejecting the sadness, allowing it and going, ah, I'm really sad about that. Let myself have my cry. Let myself have my pity day. You know, I'll, I'll let myself, uh, I always say like, if you're sad, I'm, I'm fine to lose a day to sadness. I don't wanna lose a week to sadness. I don't wanna lose a month to sadness. That's unhealthy. But to lose a day, to, to call in sick and say, you know what, can't work today, can't shoot today, don't feel good today. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you can have that mindset that there's nothing wrong with you being sad, you'll be healthier. Isn't that an irony? If you finally realize there's nothing wrong with being sad, you'll actually be healthier. And then maybe you'll be able to move on to the next part. And that is to socialize your sadness, to share with someone, I'm really sad about this. And allow for the fact that they're gonna go, oh, well, all you have to do is A, B, and C, and they're gonna try to solve it. Doesn't matter what they do. The goal isn't for them to solve it. The goal is for you to share it. That's all. Stop worrying about what they're gonna say about it or judge about it, but share it anyway. And some people say, well, that, that, sounds, that sounds crazy. That's pretty vulnerable. You know, well, I lead a team. Are you telling me I, I should tell my team that I, I, I'm upset or I'm sad or I don't feel good about this or I'm disappointed? I'm like, yeah, tell them. Well, they, well, what if they don't understand? They'll understand they've been sad too once. <laughs> that's like, why, why do you think you're so different than everybody else? That, that's what gets leaders in trouble is they don't communicate because they think they gotta be ba -ba -da -bum and so different than everybody else. I'm like, no, you know what? Sometimes your life sucks too, high performer. And you sharing with other people who are maybe high performers or even under performers isn't gonna take away from you. Sharing emotion does not diminish you. Sharing emotion makes you stronger. Sharing emotion makes you a member of the community. Sharing emotion bonds you with people. Sharing emotion opens the gate to conversation and to change. And so whether it's sadness or even joy, like stop not sharing it. Next up, big topic area in this one is, I always tell people, a healthy response is health. People ask me often, well, how do I deal with this well? I go, be healthy. 
And what I mean by that is specifically, when you know you're disappointed, when you know you're sad, when you know you've got major setbacks, you have to delay the response to order 10 gallons of pad thai. Okay, you just have to, you, you, you cannot be like, you know what, I feel terrible, so bust out the three bottles of wine, here we go. You have to delay the response that is unhealthy. Does that make sense? It's super easy. I mean, it's crazy easy to, when you are having a down day or you're feeling disappointed, to go, oh my gosh, um, and go wreck yourself and get exhausted. So what happens? You're disappointed or you have a major setback. You know what you want to do? Sometimes your response, high performers, is overwork. You're sad, so what do you do? You overwork. Or there's a major setback, so you know, I'm, I'm gonna work 24 seven for nine months. And you basically kind of kill yourself working. And so in that way you say, but I'm getting ahead. No, actually all of productivity science and all of well-being science proves over and over and over again, you compromising your sleep and overworking yourself is actually making your decisions be poorer. It's making your reactions to other people be less sensitive, less helpful. You're worse at negotiating. You're worse at closing sales. You're worse at effectiveness in your own time of doing basic tasks. You're worse at everything, everything that has to do with leadership and progress and human relationships, you're worse at when you cope by overworking. But that's what we do. Oh, I'm disappointed, so I'm gonna work harder. I'm mad, so I'm gonna work harder. Uh, the business isn't doing well, so I'm gonna work harder. But if you overwork yourself, that is not a healthy response. Next up is your daily G3 journal and review. Uh, if you've heard me teach a lot about downtimes, before, uh, especially in the last couple years, a couple years ago, the, the G3 was the three G's. And it's, what it means is every single day, I want you to journal on these three things. And I do mean journal, meaning you write it down in the morning and you review it at night. So you, that's why it says journal and review. So you write in the morning and review it all at night. And so here's what the G3 is. The first thing you know is your gratitude. And that is just, what are you grateful for? Why does that make you feel good? Why are you thankful for it? And just write it down in your journal. Just a whole, like you should have a gratitude journal already, but when you're disappointed or having setbacks, I want you to do the gratitude in the morning. A lot of gratitude journal stuff is at the night. I want you to move it right up in the morning. Like just, you gotta prime your morning for some goodness. So right off the bat, you gotta do that, okay? So gratitude. Second major thing I want you to focus on is your goals. And what are the specific daily and weekly goals you're working on? You gotta get really narrow focused, right? When you're disappointed or sad or set back, uh, you know, uh, the idea of creating a vision board and seeing out 10 years from now, that's too much. What you need to do is get really close in near term. This day's goals, this week's goals. Because if you can check those suckers off and get a little progress in, you'll feel differently as we talk about. So goals is important. And the third G is goodness. And the goodness is noticing what is good from the previous day. So when you start the day, you're like, okay, what am I grateful for in general, for life? What are my goals specifically daily and weekly in each of these different areas of my life? You might have goals in your career, in your health, in your finances, in your relationships. And then the goodness is what actually good did happen yesterday? And that will just get you in a place where you're like, oh, this day is gonna be good too. It's making you more mindful to all the good things. And the reason I do that one last, and the difference between gratitude, gratitude is general things you're grateful for. The goodness thing is to think about what good happened yesterday. And the reason we do that, because in neuroscience, we know that thinking about the goodness from yesterday is triggering your hippocampus to kind of turn on and fire up. And if we get more memory activation, off the bat in the morning, we actually have more creativity in the day too. It's weird, sparking memory is good for creativity. Creativity is very good for coping. And so that's why I'm trying to get you to reflect a little bit on something that happened yesterday, just to think through, find that mindful moment. And it's also teaching you to be more mindful as, through of the moments each day, not just grateful in general, but actually being mindful for the good moments each day. So I want you to do that journal every morning and then every night I want you to look back at it and think about it and maybe repeat it if you want to. I just want you to review 
the day and review those things. What was I grateful for? Oh yeah, that's right. Because maybe at the end of the day, the truth is you haven't moved a lot forward. Maybe, you know, your, your spouse or yourself, you're still sick, or maybe there's still conflict, or maybe the business still, because I'm not gonna be Pollyannish and say everything changes in one day and everything's great just because you did your gratitude journal. You might get to the end of the day, it still sucks. So reviewing it is gonna put you back in that positive mindset that's gonna help you then take the next day as well. Okay, last big idea in this particular section is all about these two magical words. When you have disappointment, dark days, progress and perspective are everything. Matter of fact, I remind myself of this all the time. And that is if I'm having a, a, some dark days and sad times, I'm like, I gotta get progress. So what I'll do is I'll identify my five major moves. If you read this book, High Performance Habits, you know about the five major moves. So I identify my five major moves and I'm like, I'll swiftly move towards one because momentum can shift mindset. And so if I'm in a dark, disappointment, down, momentum, like achieve some goals, but here's what's important. Notice I said the five major moves. That's what I mean with progress because what a lot of people mistakenly do is they just start doing lots of tasks and activities that aren't correlated in any way to the meaningful pursuits of life. So here's what happened. I'm bummed, I'm downed, so I'm gonna do a bunch of work. The next day they still feel bummed and down because what was their work? It was a bunch of activities that actually didn't matter, that didn't give them any meaning. So if you're down, the most important work you need to be doing is the ones that you do feel connection, enthusiasm, meaning, fulfillment, satisfaction from. Those ones that do intrinsically bring you joy, those are the ones that I want you to progress towards. Matter of fact, I really want you, when you're feeling down, disappointed, major setbacks, dark days, what I really desperately want you to do is stop multitasking and doing all the little like busy work things that don't matter. Like, like put off, like if, if it's Wednesday and you know you got a stack of bills and they're not due for another 30 days, don't pay the bills that day because that's not fun. <laughs> and you're, you got plenty of time to do it later when you, feel, like, when you get over this piece, this funk, like just say, okay, write the date on those bills, pay them on the, but don't do it today because that's busy work. Instead, today, find an activity that you find to be creative, compelling, engaging, fulfilling, and do that. Progress towards the things that have meaning. That's huge when you're down. But most people don't do that because what's comforting, just like eating comfort food, is doing low-hanging fruit activity. Now, I'll pay the bills and answer a bunch of emails. You know, but those small little tasks those don't give you enough bang for the buck to really move through it. And there's a big misconception about that in the culture, including the science, that often says, oh, no, no, just, you know, if people can complete small steps, small tasks, they'll feel better. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, we all have this reward system in our brain and a little dopamine will fall out, but do we, do we want a little drip drip of dopamine or do we want the floodgates to come open and feel alive? So I want you to do the activities that are more meaningful, not just like tasks, you know? It, it, it's really important. Let me give you an example, and I, oh, I hope this doesn't offend anybody. This is a, this is a very common thing I learned from um, uh, uh, a very, very famous female executive leadership coach. She was sharing with me that a lot of her clients, when they were down or disappointed, would they be at home and she said that what they would do is they'd decide to reorganize their closet. And I said, they what? She said, they reorganize their closet. And I said, did that, did that help them? She goes, of course not. I said, did that make them feel better? She's like, a little bit. And I said, well, did you then tell them to later on when they feel bad to organize the closet again? And she's just like laughing, we're having this conversation. And she goes, the, no, the, the, the truth is organizing the closet it makes them feel good and gives them something to do, but it's actually a delay tactic from facing what is real and needed. And so it's just as bad as comfort food. And I was like, wow. And so she asked me, she said, so Brennan, what's your closet? And I was like, oh, that's good. 
She said, what's your closet, Brenda? How do, how do you, like what do you do to delay taking on the things that are necessary when you are down or frustrated or hurt? And I had to really think about that. I was like, wow, what, what do I do that's not helping, but it's like a little busy work. It's kind of shuffling papers around. And I was like, oh, you know what I do? I, I go to my journals and my notes and I, I kind of review them or organize them. And she says, not helping. <laughs> And I said, dang it, okay, good. I said, what should I do? She goes, find the needle movers and get a little progress towards that. That major activity or major project that actually matters, one little, like, just don't give time to all the other busy work because that's just comfort food. And I was like, dang, that is a really huge insight. Progress towards those things that matter because that will also then help with this. But I think this is a very separate idea. I always say progress plus perspective. Perspective you get from time away from something or from other angles into something. And so the most important thing that I can encourage you to do, just like I asked you to socialize sadness, is to share how you're viewing the problems that you're having in your life or the challenges. And what I mean by that is literally share how you're thinking about it. So if you're struggling with something with your team or your business, then go to your team and say, hey, um, can I just walk you through how I'm thinking about this and seeing this? Perspective is not trying to solve anything, right? This doesn't say problem solving. It says perspective. It means you share specifically with other people how you are thinking about something and ask how they would think about it. Follow me? So it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with this loss in the business right now and uh, it's really bumming me out I don't know really how to think. Can I just share you how I'm thinking about it? And you need either a coach who can hear that, uh, a, a comrade, a, a collaborator, a colleague, someone who you know, like, and trust, who you can just share how you're thinking through more often. Because most disappointments happen because we get myopic, meaning we narrow our focus solely to the problem. And in not describing how we're viewing it, we can't broaden it. And so no matter what we have found in almost all social psychology research, in almost everything that I know to be true, having coached high performers for so long, is that if we can get you sharing how you're thinking about things and feeling about things with others and not trying to problem solve, but just asking how they would look at it, it actually makes you look at it a different way. Like, here's what's been going on. Here's how I'm looking at it. How would you look at it? And they might go, oh, well, I look at that, that's like, that's like really great for you. You go, what? And like, well, it gives you time now to, to kind of restart. You know, it's like the, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, he had a, a very different perspective going back to Apple than he had when he was already running it before, but got fired. And that perspective allowed him to do better. He had to go to another organization and start another company and have a whole new set of team members to help him look at things differently that allowed him when he came back to the same problem, if you will, the same opportunity, if you will, Apple, he saw it in a completely different way because he'd been with a different group of people considering a different problem and, and he learned a new ways to think. And that's what we always have to do. Keep expanding your ways of thinking about things. Now, I know none of this sounds easy. When you have a dark day, who, who wants to work out when you have a bad day? When you feel sad, who really wants to share anything? When you're pissed off, who really wants to gulp that down and be the better person? But these things are what you have to start training yourself to do if you want to cope better in the future. And sometimes in the immediate, it doesn't feel like, oh, I really want to talk this through. But I'm like, if I talk it through, I'll cope it through better. And next time, it won't be such a big deal. Here we go. And yes, do you have to force yourself to do these? Yeah, well, good thing. When we talk about high performance, we always say the journey to greatness begins not at comfort and certainty, but when we're allowing ourselves to step into discomfort and try new things. And if you're gonna reach another level of performance in your life, I'm here to suggest to you that when you're disappointed, do the things that bring discomfort, but make you better. Hey y'all, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, 
Would you please smash that subscribe button and also post any questions you have down below because it's these questions that you're all asking that inspires these episodes. I'd love to hear what you think about it. Also, if you would love to join us on our next upcoming live training, we call it our High Performance Experience Coaching Program. If you'd like some coaching and have some perspective and get some two hours of live with me every single month, then click the link in the post down below so you can join us in HPX Coaching. I'd love to give you some more strategies, more insight, and more interaction to help you reach your next level of success. Until next time, again, please subscribe, share this video with anybody who could be inspired by it today, and thanks one more time for being part of my community.